Hello and welcome to another Infinity the Game Battle Report series. This video is nominally a response to the Loss of Lieutenant February challenge, but in practice is going to be just three games with Yu Ching because I did not succeed at the challenge particularly well. However, they were interesting games and a real re-exploration of the faction for me that has me genuinely excited to play it again, which I have not been for some time. I bounced off Yu Ching quite hard in early N4, and these games have been really interesting and really enjoyable. So let's get into them. To start with, here is the, the Loss of Lieutenant February challenge. It is all about close combat. They do make the note they're not particularly interested in hearing about ARO baiting shenanigans. What, that, what that's referring to is some of the things that you can do in 1.1.1 with ARO manipulation, which we actually have rules in place for events that flow down into casual play locally that basically say we do not believe that's how the game is intended to be played or how the rules are intended to be played. So setting those aside, what they are interested in is what missions value close combat? How do you get your close combat specialists into position? How do you use close combat generally? And it's this last one, how do you get your CC specialists into position that led me to looking at Yu Ching again after a long time away. And the reason for that is that Yu Ching close combat specialists almost universally have stealth. Now, stealth is a rule, obviously, that lets you move without triggering AROs and zone of control. And that's really relevant because, as we should mostly know at this point, there's been a major change since N3 to how zone of control ARO dodges work. In N4, rather than having the change facing ARO that existed in N3, you now just dodge. And because you dodge, you can make movement, potentially up to four inches if the model has dodge plus X inches. This massively hinders getting into close combat because it puts distance between yourself and your opponent it lets your opponent open gaps between smoke templates and their models that you want to gank. It just generally makes movement into close combat both more order intensive and harder and riskier because you're likely to be exposed to AROs when your opponent's reposition. Yu Ching CC specialists universally having stealth. That's starting in particular with the Shaolin Monk, which is the only warband that retained stealth since N3 is why I went with them. So let's have a look at my list. Now, this is the first of two lists that you'll see in these battle reports. There's a second list that I basically varied and tried different things with about halfway through the month. But this is where we started. Now, it's got a Sujan. A Sujan is a staple of Yu Ching, almost to the point where it's a bit of a weight on the faction's tactical acumen. You'll often hear Yu Ching players talk about how the game is won and lost in the first turn via an Alpha Strike. And it's kind of the Sujan that I think causes that impression. Uh, a Sujan is like a bear pode before bear podes existed, except it's more dangerous, it's faster, it's more mobile, it's tougher, but it is hackable. A Sujan can be stymied very effectively by a good deployment zone hacking network. And it's kind of that interaction that left me pretty stalled on Yu Ching generally in early N4. I've mentioned this in previous events and in some comments, but basically I had a number of games where I ended, I, I led with the Sujan and I ended with it outside my opponent's deployment zone, isolated and mobilized and targeted on a rooftop. Now, to the effect of solving that problem, we're trying in this list a number of light, irregular, close combat pieces with stealth. We have two Shaolin monks. We have a the newly minted Beast Hunter, which is also a close combat stealth camouflage for deploying special, um, model. Now, it, when I say it's close combat, it's burst to CC21 with surprise attack with an explosive CCW, which is just good enough to risk using, but it's really on the low end of what makes a good CC specialist. Still, it can do it. And then we also have Lang Kai in this list, although he is going to end up getting cut just to try some different things out in the next version of this list. We also have a Libertos and some Longyars, basically to round out that kind of like camouflage, CC, template, expendable, light attack option that I want to be able to have in the list. So there's lot to loads of mines, loads of camouflage tokens, and I've got basically four or five elements between the Libertos, the Beast Hunter, the two Shaolin Monks, and Liang Kai that I can move in with and attack light opponent elements in the midfield, the repeaters, hacking networks, without risking my Sujan. It's basically a jab to lead with, to follow up with a cross, um, so that the Sujan isn't my all or nothing play. I want to really avoid those kinds of games where I win or lose on the first turn because I either win with the Sujan or the Sujan gets stalled and the game toilet bowls. So that was what I'm looking to do with this list. There's one other thing that's present in this list, 
that's kind of secondarily an attempt to deal with a problem that I find I have with Yu Ching, which is combat group restraints. The 15 trooper limit has been more restrictive for me trying to play Yu Ching than it has for any other faction. Um, Caledonians and Ariadna, I have no problems with 15 troops and done, but in Yu Ching, it's really awkward. It's particularly awkward because Quangxi are great, but they're a real weight on your combat groups and they make combat group construction really awkward. To solve this problem, I've gone and included Sun Se Marksman Leader. Now, he's considered a little bit of a meme, or at least historically he has, but he really does solve this problem of group constraint. He's an active trooper, he can fight if he needs to. Really, he's like if you took Saladin and paid not that many points to turn him into a genuinely dangerous sniper. But he also lets you change your combat groups on the fly, and he adds an order to a combat group in a way that, yes, you can do that with a Daoying operative. Um, a Daoying, in fact, will add more orders if you're bringing sufficient NCOs because it's a lieutenant plus one order. But the Daoying itself is, is something that's in a combat group but not usually doing anything for much of the game. It's one more piece in those groups that you have to just sort of like accept that the slot is dead to fuel other things. And the more you do that in Yu Ching, the more your assets get concentrated and concentrated and concentrated into two or three attack pieces that are all heavy infantry and hackable. I wanted to have a more diverse, more active set of combat groups where there were more pieces that could do something, and Sunsi was kind of a solution to that. Now, it was very experimental, but then he fucking slapped for like six games. Holy shit, he has been so good. So this is this is the Sun Sea Battle Report series. I have been super happy with him. I am going to keep including him in Yu Ching lists. Rounding out the list otherwise, and which will stay in the lists over the course of the battle reports, we have a Yan Ho with Hyper Rapid, Net Hyper Rapid Magnetic Cannon, which is really just a great piece. I love using tags as fire support. The Yan Ho is not as tough as a tag, not by any stretch of the imagination, but he's also way cheaper, and he's a BS-14 Burst 5 big fucking cannon. There are also two Long Yars, and then an Engineer and a Doctor, and a Quang Shi set, but it's one Celestial Guard and two Quang Shi. This is kind of a necessary cut because we've only got 15 troops. I would put more Quang Shi in there if I can, but ultimately two Quang Shi is enough to do kind of like their cheap orders. It's still cheaper to take a Celestial Guard and two Quang Shi than any other three order generators. Um, it only becomes less efficient when you have a Celestial Guard and one Quang Shi. So this is still an efficient order generation pool and it frees up my combat group slots to have things like a Doctor and an Engineer for the Long Yars and the Yan Ho, and then all of these like lighter, more diverse pieces. If you look at the rest of the list, I have the Celestial Guard Monitor, two Kuang Shi, a Mech Engineer, and a Doctor, and those are the only things that are support. The remaining 10 pieces in the list are all either aggressive or useful defense or a combination of the two. So with the first version of this list shown, let's have a look at the first game. Now, this was a game of Eternal Rivals. Um, we have, I know they look like nomads, but I assure you those are Pan-Oceanians on the left uh, and my Yu Ching on the right. This game was Frontline, and my opponent was trying out a vanilla Yu Ching list, so vanilla Pan-Oceania list, which I do not have the entire list on hand, but it was a Joan of Arc list with the usual bevy of great irregulars, which there are even more of now, um, so there was a Beast Hunter, and a Biker, and a Tech Bee, and a War Correspondent, and a Libertos, and I think a Monstrucker as well. But then the big active pieces in addition to that, oh, there was a Helot if I didn't say that. The big active pieces were Joan herself, Mobility Form Spitfire, the bike is a pretty good active piece, but then a Tick Balang, and a Knight of Justice Hacker. So it's pretty concentrated in terms of Joan, the Tick Balang, and the Knight are very expensive, but very, very good. But it had enough left points left over to also take two Peacemakers and a Kahu with Fwerback. Now, the Kahu as an NCU piece is kind of, NCO piece, is kind of just okay with Joan, because obviously Joan can use her Lieutenant Order to coordinate. But the Kahu did drop into the second combat group, so it could use the Order in Group 2, offered some flexibility that way while Joan was in Group 1. And also, Kahu are incredible, and it meant that there was one more really big gun in the list in case the... Tickbalang went down. I also really, really like the Knight of Justice in this list. I don't think it fit a guided missile launcher, 
but it's there are two Fugazi drone bots in the deployment zone, and then there are two peacemakers on the 20 inch line, which means that as an ARO piece, the knight is fantastic. It's only whip 13 hacker, but I'm still not willing to run a Sujan through a repeater network against whip 13 oblivions. The risk is too high. And the knight itself is almost impossible to kill with standard KHDs. It's heavy infantry BTS9 behind a firewall, and it's really dangerous on the attack. Uh, just randomly, the Knight of Justice has dechargers, which means that it is a phenomenally dangerous close combat model. In addition to its good CC stats, it's fast, it's a hacker. The only downside it has is that it only has a combi rifle. It would be a total package if it had a multi-rifle. But because it's 6-2 and a hacker, you can still do all sorts of things, and it will do some cool stuff this game. Now, just to note, to save time, and because these games have happened over the course of the last month, these will all be fairly high level. There are some things that I will miss, but we'll kind of go through the high points, and I'll show you broadly how it is that I played each game and what the, the useful and interesting flashpoints were. So you can see my deployment here. I have won the roll. Whip 17 will do that sometimes, and I've elected to deploy second, and my opponent is absolutely not game to let me go first um, in order to have scenario advantage in frontline, which is totally fair. Um, even if it wasn't he and I playing, and we've both sort of played that game before, um, you do not want to give a Yuqing player first turn. If you also give them deployment advantage, the Sujan will mess you up. So how I've deployed here, and how this is really going to be the case in most of the games where I go second, is... There are no hackers in this list, but there are two Longya. And the Longya and the Camo Presence generally is your ablative defense. They fill the role of annoying things that have to die before your opponent can attack you at low risk. The fact that they're camouflaged and mine layers and have only disposable weapons, but very, very threatening disposable weapons, basically makes them great for this role. And as a Yuqing player, if you can fit two Longyars in your list, you kind of always want to, because the insulation that they offer you against a first turn attack is just very, very strong. So what we've done here is we've built kind of a camo hell uh, around here, and that's a series of, there's a Beast Hunter, a Libertos, uh, a series of mines, etc., etc., etc. And then over here on the other flank, we have the second long yard and the uh, the second long yard mine. Now, going second here, because I could reserve most of my force after for after my opponent's initial deployment, I actually used Sunsei Strategos to reserve the two long yards. I didn't place them until I'd seen everything my opponent had, and I, I really liked that. Um, you can kind of, because you're not usually going to be putting the Yanho or Sun Si himself, or the Sujan up as ARO pieces, and they, they're the things that you would reserve if you were going first, for example. You can kind of just put them in positions that are mostly safe based on how your opponent has deployed, and then you can drop the long yards as your reserves to really thoroughly stymie your opponent's attack. And in particular, that can be useful because how you want a long yard to be positioned is somewhere that it's got crossfire that is dangerous for your opponent to deal with, but which they have to move several times to get an easy line of fire. So for example, this long yard here, the, the Tikbalang is hanging out back there and the Kahu is over here, but this long yard's line of fire, it, it, it can see this rooftop here, but the Tikbalang will have to break cover to see it. And it can see this rooftop over here, but the Kahu will have to move several times to see it. And in a similar note, this long yard is kind of insulated from everything. It cannot see any of this stuff, but it does have great lines of fire against peacemakers advancing to my deployment zone. Now, please excuse the horrible left-handed <laughs> line or art there. So basically the idea is that these, these will stall out my opponent for a turn. And true to form, that's basically what happened. The Tikbalang and the Kahu attacked on the first turn and they were able, annoyingly, they were able to discover the Longyar, they were able to engage the Longyar, but pretty much an entire turn was spent by these two pieces attacking and destroy attacking and rendering unconscious not destroying the two long yard there was also an attempt by a peacemaker to attack down this flank but the oxbot ran headlong into a mine and died and the peacemaker basically wasn't game to continue after that there was there was at least one other mine down here and it would have just it would have just killed it as well having multiple layers of mines insulating against that kind of attack was excellent now my counter attack and one of the turning points in my thoughts on how to play yu ching in this edition were there was a Tikbalang here. You can just see that in the top of the screen there. I had a Yanho Hyperhypermetic Cannon that I could have engaged with, but 
that fight is, well, it's mostly fine, but there was a Kahu standing here as well. So if the Yan Ho stood up, it would be engaging both at the same time, and that is much less good. So what I did instead was I activated Sun Tzu. I swapped him into a different combat group using his ability, and he came up these stairs. And this face-to-face -face roll between these two points was about 40 inches. Maybe a little less, maybe like 35, 36. And my opponent had nowhere that they could guts to that they could get to total cover with the tick blind. So I was shooting, I ignored the mimetism because my MSV. I was firing double action rounds because that's still more effective against armor six than AP is. I was hitting on 14s. My opponent was in bad range and I had cover, so he was hitting on nines. This took like seven orders, but Sun Tse just killed the tick blind. He just nailed it to the wall, killed it straight dead. Never at any particular risk. If he'd been crit, there was a chance he could have died. But otherwise, if he was going to go on, if he went to no wound incapacitation, I could have healed him, had ample command tokens. Um, but he just didn't lose a face-to-face -face roll because he was rolling two dice 14s to one dice nines. And he just took the tick belang down, which was fantastic and totally unexpected. And if he'd been a passive lieutenant, I'm not sure what piece I had could have done that. So with that kill out of the way, the Yan Ho was able to stand up uh, and engage and destroy the Kahu. Um, again, some risk there, but five dice is a lot of dice. It was five dice 11s to one dice 13s, and he just blitzed the Kahu. I had actually wanted to try and get into close combat on this turn, and Lang Kai was in position to move up and around here and along this ledge. But basically, I had to stall that out because I ran into what is functionally the curse of Kaldheim, Kaldstrom buildings. They're all too bloody tall to jump. Uh, most of them basically don't allow you easy jumping access because of how you've got to go up and over with a jump. And a four inch super jump is pretty much not good enough to get anywhere on this map, unfortunately. You can kind of agree with your opponent beforehand that maybe that's a bit dumb and it should be more traversable, but we didn't and I wasn't willing to push it. That was a pretty damn serious rejoinder. Like literally my opponent has lost his two major firepower pieces. I've pulled Sun Tzu back, but the Yan Ho is standing. And that kind of decides the game. Like, I can't really push much more, but he's he's in the shit. Um, there is a... I end up making an attack. I think I've got enough orders left to um, run a Shaolin Monk up here, literally just to stab a Fugazi Dronbot to death. Uh, and my opponent responds in his turn by basically doing the same thing back with a Knight of Justice. And it's actually a really solid attack where it comes sort of like out here, around here, um, and it, it ends up sort of like down here, trying to engage the Sujan, and there's like a messy fight. It gets through the minefield because its fizz is good enough, its armor is good enough, um, blah, blah, blah. I eventually collapse in on it with Libertos, Sujan, and a variety of different things. It takes a whole lot, but it brings it down. But at that point, my opponent's pretty much strapped. Now, I'm kind of condensing some action here. Some of this happened over the course of a couple of turns. Um, but we ended up in a situation where Joan had to make a run on his last turn. She ended up sort of about here. But it was just too much. Like, Joan, Joan with a Spitfire is fantastic. Um, she put a wound on the, the Yanpo and dropped it, dropped it to prone. But then she'd done a wound to something. And I stood up next turn and just absolutely deleted her. Um, to put the cherry on top, uh, Sun Tse, as a medium infantry, um, ran all the way up here, all the way up here, was 51 points in a zone, um, secured the HVT over here, and also did follow up uh, because he's medium infantry and whip 17. So just... Absolute man of the match on say, but also the one, the, the Yan Huo. I got into close combat basically twice, um, once to finish off the uh, the Knight of Justice and once to kill one Fugazi up here just because I had the orders to spend. But this was really not a CC game. This was a game where big guns on medium and heavy infantry were very, very impressive. Uh, also to note, this was another bit, this was a bit of a demonstrator of the... Um, the value of long yards where they stalled out my opponent's first turn and i actually had the orders to fix both of them back up now i i, I lost this poor um helper bot down here doing it because it got stuck out in the ocean open and killed in a subsequent turn but i was able to stand both long yards up what i wasn't able to do and didn't have the orders to do is re-camouflage and this is something that i haven't really been able to do in subsequent games either but it is worth seriously considering whether or not you have a, maybe a combat group that can accommodate a coordinated re-camouflage order because it's really that level of 
ablative defense, the one wasted order that it spends to you to spend to discover a marker, that really helps Longya insulate your DC. If you stand them back up, that's well and good, but if they're not camouflaged, then they will go right back down again to the first face-to-face -face roll. So with one game out of the way, and basically no relevant close combat, just some close combat opportunity and a crazy run with a Shaolin Monk, let's have a look at how I changed my list <laughs> in a subsequent game. So this is the actually second version of the and one that I would play for most of my games. Um, I had, in between the game that you're about to see and the first game that I played, I'd had, I think, two two other games. Um, one of which Sun Tzu killed a Swiss guard by himself, uh, and the other one in which he killed Wolfgang Mozart by himself. So really kicking goals the entire time, uh, and he has just genuinely like killed things many, many games. Um, so really cementing his place in the list. But what I've done here is I had found that I wasn't using the Doctor, and that Lang Kai was struggling a little bit. I actually really like Lang Kai, but but he just hadn't been a fit for the games, and I wanted to try something else. Um, so although he's fantastic, this is what I've kind of settled on. What we've added here is a Luxing Specialist Operative. So that's the Fizz 14 Heavy Infantry Drop Troop with Multi-Rifle Dechargers Specialist. It can do a ton of classifieds. And to afford it, we've downgraded, we've actually cut the Doctor entirely, um, cut Lang Kai entirely and downgraded the engineer to a Monstrucker, um, which is cheaper but irregular, and we've got a Kong Shi to fill out the groups. That third Kong Shi actually makes the combat groups more awkward. But we've kind of reorganized things here generally so that all of the camo is in the second combat group alongside the Lushing, and then all of the guns and the Sujana in combat group one, along with the Shaolin monks. This is probably, I think, my preferred layout for this, but I'm still not set on the Lushing, uh, and in fact, he has failed me a whole lot. The Fizz 14 to drop is, I don't know why, but it's its eminently failable. Um, I've, I've run him in three games now, and he's passed one drop roll, and it really sucks when he fails, although there is the caveat that he is a 6-2 heavy infantry which means that he can kind of get back in the fight with that multi-rifle if you need him to. But there's a big difference between a Sujan that tears into the backfield and a Sujan that is just, hey, it's a BS-13 heavy infantry with a multi-rifle. How much did you pay for that? Way too much, it turns out, if you wanted to just use it as a generic troop moving up the field. Um, it's also worth noting that the Lu Xing suffers from the same things that a Sujan does, which is that he kind of sucks shit when your opponent has a really good hacking network unless he can kind of like land on their one hacker immediately. Um, but we'll get to that in the third game. This is the second game that I played. So in this scenario, we played, I think, Frontline again. Yes, we played Frontline again, um, because it's one of the events that's uh, is an upcoming event, which will be Frontline Rescue and Armoury. Um, and this was the table that we had for it. On this table, the trees are all just, they provide total cover, they are solid objects basically up to the height of the trees from their base, so no looking underneath trees, etc. Um, and the hedges are also solid, and they're, they're kind of like just tall enough to obscure a prone model from sort of a distance. One thing that we have done is that we've played with no special rules for getting onto roofs. You have to just climb or jump, um, which I kind of regret in hindsight based on how my opponent deployed. And I feel like we probably should have some rule. The, the buildings are glued together. You can't access the interiors. Um, but I feel like there should be some rule, maybe, for example, with like doorways allowing you access onto a roof or something. Because my opponent was playing White Company, and they deployed a pair of Guilang mine layers with repeaters in functionally inaccessible places. Um, so one repeater went down here with its Guilang literally on this roof, and one repeater went down, I think, here with its Guilang on this roof. And it was just like, oh, good. I've done this to myself. Okay, then. Um, fortunately, this is kind of just like the game beforehand, right? Good midfield repeaters with a hacking network behind them means I don't want to attack with the Sujan which is a good test of what I'm looking to do with this list, which is to have light assets. Now, the rest of my opponent's list, I don't have everything. I, I'm just like a, with a Panoshenian list before, it's been a while since I've played this game. But there was a very light core link consisting of Fusiliers, a Hideout Multi-Sniper, and Valeria Gromos, the first hacker in the list. There was also a Danavus, fantastic hacker in second combat group, a Clipper-Guided Missile Bot, 
uh, and then a very light team of a Kahu and John Hawkwood, which is pretty cool actually, because the Kahu can like NCO that team forward, and then Hawkwood does most of the heavy lifting with his um with his Red Fury. The Kahu is also a specialist. That was just kind of cool. Um, and then there are some Varankians. It's a fifteen trooper list. It's it's quite light. Like the only heavy piece really is the the pseudo HI you get from the um, multi sniper in the core link. Um, but a really good list actually, and like. Just a really great showcase of how White Company is, is kind of awesome. Um, for my part, I deployed kind of the same. I was going second in this, this game as well. And we ended up with sort of the Sujan down here. Um, Saladin, sorry, <laughs> slip of the tongue. Uh, Sunse down here, and then the Yanhuo on this rooftop. And then just Long Yars with kind of like long Overwatch positions. But in particular, the Long Yar were positioned so that they could not be seen by the Hideout Sniper immediately. I did try and pin Valeria Gromos down on this rooftop. So that was like that I used this, this position here to like slice so that I could only see her and not the Hideout, which was down behind this bin. Um, but ultimately on the very first order of Rankin Guard Impetuous and through Smoke, and that was that. But fair enough. So this game was one of those ones where the defense held barely and then everything went to shit everywhere. Anyway, um, which we'll get to in a moment. So the attack my opponent made was a solid one based on thoroughly false premises. <laughs> um, what he did was uh, move the Varangians up with their impetuous orders, laid down some smoke, which I don't really have any response to, and I'm certainly not putting Sun Tse out on hard ARO duty. And he moved his core link up here. Now I had, sort of in hopes of defending against this, I had two long yards, and then I had camo marker, camo marker, camo marker prone with my mimetism. So this is a Libertos, and either of these could be something. Now, as it happens, this is a mine, and this is the Beast Hunter. The Beast Hunter was here, because I one, I wanted it to look like a mine to try and stop the Guilang from moving forward, but two, it's got super jump, and these buildings were just tall enough that I could jump up over here and destroy that bloody repeater, and then jump up here and go after the Guilang. Now, I would never get to do that, because what actually happened is that my opponent moved his link team forward and it was very careful, like really careful movement. What he was looking to do basically was all the link team's job was, was to clear off our row pieces and land a pitcher down here. And once a pitcher was down there, the second combat group could take over and do some things. Now we'll get to why my opponent thought he was doing something smart that was actually kind of a mistake in a moment. But what's important is that the pitcher attack failed because this thing that looked like a mine turned out to be a beast hunter that fired a Panzerfaust at Valeria Gromos and killed her. Now, the Libertos and the Longya on the right flank all died. Like, I lost a ton of things defending this. Um, the, beast hunter, the beast hunter died, the Libertos died, and the Longya died, all for no further profit. But I stalled the attack, and I basically locked the team up in the midfield. The Hydao was here. The rest of the team were like scattered around there, kind of defended, but kind of not, and a four-man team, no longer a five-man team. At this point, my opponent said, ah, oh, damn, what I was really hoping to do was isolate Sun Tse. And that's kind of exactly why I'm taking the Marksman Leader, not the standard heavy infantry version. Marksman Leader is a medium infantry. Heavy infantry version is a heavy infantry and is susceptible to oblivion. Now it's kind of hard to hack Sun Tse. He's whip 17, he resets really, really well. But an Oblivion will still do him and put you in loss of Lieutenant. You cannot do that to Sunsei Marksman Leader. He's medium infantry. He's also super hard to kill with a guided missile strike, which is what I assumed my opponent was doing. So he put a repeater down here, is what he was kind of aiming for. How you respond to that with Sunsei is, well, firstly, you try and just win the reset war and waste your opponent's orders. But assume the worst happens and they get, they get a spotlight through. They will sooner or later. Um, firstly, if you can, you want to guts out of the repeater area which would have been just possible on the setup. And then when the missile strike lands, you reset. You reset on 14s and one missile cannot kill you unless it crits because you have total immunity. Having total immunity is like a super big deal sometimes. And this is one of those cases. You reset on 14s, you hope, I mean, you might just tank the missile hit. You're armor two and it's damage 14 and that's it. Um, but even if you take a wound, you're probably not dead and you probably have successfully reset and all of everything your opponent did is kind of for nothing. So super unlikely that my opponent was going to succeed with this guided missile attack. Um, and in fact, what he thought he was doing was oblivioning my HI lieutenant and I don't have a HI lieutenant. So in any case, this had felt like 
a fairly good defensive turn. Losing three pieces in ARO kind of sucks a little bit. Um, that's a not insignificant portion of your force. But having trapped my opponent's link team like in the midfield here felt just like prime to deliver a coup de grace and win the game. One thing that my opponent did that was really clever, which he loves doing, is he, he used his remaining orders to run a Varankiana to stand like basically in front of the Hydao. And what its job would be to do is the second it had an ARO, it would throw an unopposed smoke grenade onto the Hydao and die. And that would put the Hydao in smoke and make it basically much, much harder for me to kill than, than like, it had any right to be. Uh, this is an old tactic. You'd see Yuching players do this with Rushis and Suppressive Fire, but a Hydao obviously is a hell of a lot more dangerous than ARO. Now, I'm not going to cover everything that happened on my first active turn, but suffice to say that it was one of the biggest cavalcades of failure I have ever seen in this game. After three casualties, I had 13 orders, regular and irregular, to spend, and I spent only two of those orders attempting to do something like maneuver. 11 of those 13 orders were spent making face-to-face -face rolls, every single one of which basically fucking failed. It was atrocious. The first thing that happened was that the Yanho, which had fantastic odds of killing the um, Hainau sniper, stood up and basically got knocked unconscious in one reactive, one turn of reactive fire. The Rangian got smoked down. Um, the Lushing failed its roll to land, which would have let me neutralize like a whole lot of stuff. The 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 Lushing was landing down here, out of repeater area, and it could have killed the Danavis over here, and then just lit the fuck up the uh, link team members in the open relative to it here. Nope, it failed, didn't make its, six, didn't, didn't make its landing. Um, and then I basically had to take face-to-face -face rolls with Sun Tzu, which, which did nothing. Like everything failed. Every possible attempt to do anything failed. And I was, oh, I just, I, that's the game then, I thought. Um, that kind of sucks. Sometimes it happens. It's pretty rare that you have that many failures in a row. But taken some photos in the interest of playing things out. My opponent was trying out White Company. We pushed on through. I did ask my opponent play reasonably quickly and put me out of my misery. What he did then on his second turn was he w moved out with the John Hawkwood duo. Now he's down a couple of orders, right? Because he took, no, he's, he took that Gromos casualty. Um, it doesn't really, his groups, his second group isn't set to do very much now, but Hawkwood and co moves out with about 10 orders and they move up here and then up here and then up here and they killed the Lushing and they killed the Long Yard. The Long Yard had moved down and surprise shot with a template and like broken the link up and that had failed. Like so many, so many plays went horribly wrong. Um, killed the Long Yard that had tried to surprise shot um, two and like template and like had a template. Flamence Brown, a line of fire, was two shots on 14s and just missed both of them. Like, oh my God. Um, so they, the, the, this team basically killed everything there. And, but in doing so, uh, they also killed a Quang Shi as well. So, so three three solid kills from Hawkwood's company. But in making those attacks, and in particular on going after the Quang Shi, um, he left with left himself with not quite enough orders to pull all the way back. Oh, there was a peacemaker here as well, because of course there was. Um, peacemakers are fantastic. Three deployment zone, sorry, three midfield repeaters. Um, so what what that left Hawkwood with is sort of like here and then on ground level behind. with the, So the Kahu and Hawkwood, very, very close to my deployment zone. And if I could jump on them, then like maybe I had a chance in the game. So we basically roll up our sleeves and try and get lucky again. And fortunately, I don't fail a 12th consecutive face-to-face -face roll when Sun Tzu comes out here and fights the Hydao Sniper again and puts it down. From there... He moves back around this way. I think he moves sort of up here. He's able to completely ignore the war correspondent up there because of total immunity. And he puts a wound on Hawkwood, which forces him back into cover. And he ends up kind of just like around here or something, whatever. He's done his job. The point is the Overwatch is now down and the Shujan like rattles out. Um, it comes around the corner. It's super, super fast. Um, Frontlines is a scenario which I think has the um, Antarctic terrain. So it's moving nine inches with its first short skill. And it just just aces the Kahu and then it aces um, Hawkwood. It, it cleans them up easily. Um, and it sort of sets itself up in this position here where its Panzerfaust provides an ARO. But my opponent doesn't have a toll of guns left. He's, he's actually like a little locked out. There are still like Fusiliers and stuff floating around here. 
but they're not they're not really in position to do a lot of anything. I've taken some shots actually, some like back arc shots even on some of them with Sunsei, but they've they've just survived and like I've, I've rolled a pair of bloody 19s to hit again. Um and they've you know they've ended up in cover. But my opponent at this point, really, all that they're left with, um, they've done no classifieds. They're not securing the HVT. Um and and they're left with basically some Guilongs on rooftops that can't get down. Um, so what my opponent does is he is it's front line. He tries to move everything up that he can, uh, and he moves his guided missile bot up to about here. Takes an engagement with the Sujan, which cannot, except for like catastrophically bad luck, kill the Sujan. Doesn't kill the Sujan, but does put me into no winning cap. That's how I'm on one dice fourteens. He's on one dice twelves. Of course I lose. Um, and so the Sujan gets put into no winning cap, which makes the next turn harder. But hey. We've got close combat. So there's a Shaolin monk back here. And it ends up, you know, like smoke down, move forward, smoke down, and then run into CC with the uh with the missile bot and kill it. Fantastic, cool, and the rest of my turn is the rest of my turn is just moving forward. But we do have one last extremely cheeky Sun Tzu related play. I have Hazivak as one of my classifieds, and Sun Tzu is in the no wound incapacitation state which is an unconscious state, which qualifies you for being casualty evac. So a Shaolin monk picks Sun Si up and runs him up the field, basically. Um, it takes me more orders to do this than just moving Sun Si would, but I get him across the halfway line and with the rescue classified, that's two points. <laughs> So I am securing the HVT, I think, with Sun Tzu. Um, Sun Si is in Kazivak and scoring me another two points that way. And I'm between Sun Si and the Sujan and just various pieces in my zones. I'm not able to contest my opponent's far zone, um, but I am comfortably securing my zone and the middle, and I've scored three points off of classifieds. So this has somehow, despite a thoroughly catastrophic first active turn, ended up being a win, um, and kind of another game where Sun Tzu just as a gun carried me a little bit. Now the Lu Xing here failed horribly, and this is kind of a game where probably, I mean, a doctor to pick up the Yan Ho would have been really good. Um, there's no two ways about that. I was very, very unlucky for the Lu Xing to go down in, in one face-to-face -face roll against a Heindao, but it is possible. And it's one of those things, the Lu Xing's not a tag, it's much cheaper, it just shoots like a tag. Having a doctor behind it would not have been a bad idea, and this had been one of those cases. On the other hand, I cut the doctor in order, as part of a package, in order to fit the Lushing, and if the Lushing had just fucking landed, maybe I'd be singing the Lushing's praises for just, like, gutting my opponent's backfield. So, um, more data required. I am kind of leaning back towards maybe a Doctor is the right call, but let's jump into the third game and see the Lushing finally actually land a roll. So this is the same list as previous. And we're playing the Armory against Morat Aggression Force. Um, once again, don't have the list for this, but I will describe it briefly. Um, it was a Raicho, a series of combat remotes, a Q drone, Dr. Worm, a bunch of Dadarazi, and then the only link team was a three person Yaogat team with Kornak, a Yaogat Spitfire, which probably really should have been a sniper, but this list was tailored for Armory, which we were playing, and a Yaogat Hacker. And that fucking Yaogat hacker once again stymied all of my hopes for an easy offensive attack. Now, this was armory, so there is an exclusion zone, and on top of that, Morats don't have midfield repeaters, but there were two R drones and two Ica drones, which meant my opponent's deployment zone was saturated with repeater areas, which meant that the Lushing was just as bad as the Sujan at making attacks in this scenario. Again, it's just a single whip 13 hacker. Maybe I am being too cautious against those things, but even if they aero with carbonite and you just get bricked that way, it's so bad. Like there are so many things that go wrong when heavy infantry can just try and attack into repeated networks that I've just learned not to do it. So in this game, I have lost the role, um, whip 14 to whip 17, and I have chosen, and my opponent has chosen to set up second on his side of the board, and I've chosen to go first. Um, this is actually a good showcase of how I like to play the armory if I'm going first, which is to not open the gates. Just don't. Make it your opponent's problem. I deploy with my long yards kind of in relatively... In armory, it's harder for long yards to get like crossfire positions that you might like, because obviously there's a massive, great, infinitely tall building in the way. Um, and you have to look at your opponent's deployment zone a little bit more, which I don't love, but we've got kind of, you know, some decent angles um, with the long yard sort of into various different positions. And in any case, I am going first. 
the Yan Ho in this in this table, we use these buildings are closed, um, but you can use these doorways to get to the roof above them with a short movement skill. Um, and so a Yan Ho is going to end up reserve dropping here and going onto this rooftop where it'll have a relatively dominant field of fire. And Sun Tzu is down over here. Now this is going to be the first game where Sun Tzu doesn't really kill anything. Um, there had to be one up until now. He's killed like twice his bloody points cost every game. Uh, by sniping things. I think this game he tries to fight a, uh, a Yao Gat out of cover once and I just whiff the roll, whatever, it happens. I go into no wounded cap and I'm not game to take the fight a second time. Totally all right. He does end up being very important though. Um, the Sujan is going to deploy down here and then we've got a bunch of monks and stuff and my opponent with his two reserve drops um, deploys, I didn't remember what the second one is, I think it's actually Kornak, but the main thing is that the Raicho comes down here. Now, this is what I would call a bit of a mistake for tag deployment. Um, in particular, a you really, really want a tag to be deployed somewhere that it can it can take AROs if it needs to to like try and push back impetuous pieces, but where it can guts back into total cover. Now a Raicho is religious, so sometimes it just won't do that, particularly at Web 12. But the option is really important. Now, in this table, that would have meant maybe deploying back here or behind this building here. Um, but he's put it behind this big flower bed. And in doing so, he's put it in a position where it can't really retreat. What it does do is kind of what I find the Raicho sometimes does, which is literally occupy the entire first turn of your opponent. Um, I, this this turn, I get two kills. Uh, I kill the Q drone. So the, the Yan Ho activates and what it's able to do actually, the Raicho is a little shorter than this. So maybe that's my opponent thought it was safe. But the Yan Ho moves up onto the back of this rooftop where it can't see the Raicho, absolutely guns down the Q drone, uh, and then it moves forward. And at this point we have basically a big four-way gunfight. So I engage, I engage the Raicho. There's sort of like an inclusive face-to-face -face role. I actually don't do that many in the way. I really don't do any wounds. I pause up in that attack because this is one of those ones where if my opponent just rolls well and I flub everything, an explosive round will kill me and I have no doctor. I land the Yuxing down, Luxing down here. It's behind the Raicho. It moves out and back and it takes a shot. Three shots in the back from outside eight inches, out eight, eight, eight inches hitting on 16 with armor piercing rounds. I hit with two of them. My opponent fails one save, takes a wound. It changes its facing to have both the Yan Ho and the Lu Xing and Line of Fire, which lets me activate this Long Ya and take a shot in the back with a pair of Panzerfausts. I hit with both. Six armor saves. He passes five of them, but it was lucky to even hit with both in the first place. I needed to roll 11s. Um, he changes his facing again, but he's basically caught in this kind of like triangle where I think he ends up managing to like hold everything at bay, but he's taken two wounds at this point and I, I put him down finally with the with the Yan Ho. So between all of this firepower, um, and there's also a Dadarazi here, which like dodges to try and like stop the Lushing, but then is in the open and it, it dies last. Um, so I get three casualties on the enemy this turn, a an unconscious Q drone, a dead Raicho and a dead Dadarazi. And otherwise I just move forward. I haven't touched the armory at all, but I do put like a Shaolin monk here. And that's kind of it. Um, if my opponent wants to spend their turn, down three orders, four really, moving up here, through line of fire, maybe look, putting some smoke down to block Longyar's line of fire, and then coming into the armory, I will give them happily the one point from scoring the armory on the first turn, and then I will collapse on whatever they've got in that armory, like the Wrath of God, and kill it. Ideally, I will use models with smoke in close combat, because that's what this challenge was about but my opponent does not have a bar of it. Um, the doors remain closed and he uses his turn to attack me just as I used it to attack him. Uh, Kornak's team kind of move out here. This is a long yard mine and they spend a bit of time worrying about it and end up discovering it at some waste. Um, they put down and dis they discover and put down this long yard, but that's kind of all that they do. They sort of get like trapped here a little bit um, and the doors remain closed. It's few enough casualties that my counterattack, even though it 
flubs kind of badly, where Sun Si has a model out of cover, but he just doesn't win the face-to-face -face roll, and then I move in with a monk, and my opponent says, oh no, that thing is standing, and I'm like, oh, I thought they were all prone, there's markers next to everything. Oh no, sorry, my prone marker just looks identical to my link team marker. Like, oh fuck, okay. So a Shaolin monk dies for nothing. Um, but eventually the, the Sujan gets up onto this rooftop and kills a couple of things. And it's like various bits and bobs of awkwardness. Um, but I'm able to mostly put this link out of its misery. I think the, the what really does it in the end is the Beast Hunter here moves to there and then up onto the rooftop. And it actually, he's done enough, basically the, the various attack pieces have forced enough reactive dodging that the um, Beast Hunter gets into close combat with uh, Yao Gat here and threatens flamethrower hits there and there. Um, and so basically he's split between shooting and dodging and it's just an awkward, because it's all light infantry, it's an awkward shot. And I think he he kills the Beast Hunter, um, tanks the save on Kornak, but the the hacker dies. And then the Sujan is able to finish off the, um, the Sujan is able to finish off the other Yaogat. And that pretty much puts pay to my opponent's ambitions. Kornak is still alive, but he's, he's seriously gutted at this point. Um, I... I actually do open the armory gates, and to be frank, I probably didn't need to. Um, this monstrucker gets off the building with climbing plus and moves up there. I actually would have been advantaged not opening them. Still make it my opponent's problem, because what happened was I move in, I open the gates, and then my opponent has a play where they're able to run Kornak into the armory. Um, and if I hadn't opened the gates, no, nah, doesn't have shit. He's out of specialists. Dr. Worm is like pinned down on this rooftop and or dead. Um, I think he died trying to pick a Q-Drone back up, or would die trying to pick a Q-Drone back up. Um, so yeah, I, open, I opened the gates going first, probably shouldn't have. It just gave my opponent a way to score one point, but then I collapse in. Um, what I do actually discover um, after the Libertos kills Kornak, because Libertos is our bosses, is this list is really bad for armory because you can't get into the armory with chonky models anymore. <laughs> The armory gates are narrow gates, and there are rules for those, and they literally only admit troops of silhouette two size or lower. Which means that a Sujan can shoot into the armory, but it can't get into it. A Yanho can shoot into the armory, but it can't get into it. Long Yars can't get into the armory. All of the things I have that can I put in the armory are either very, very cheap, right, like Libertos and Shaolin monks, or they are Sunsei. And so I literally had to do that on the last turn, was get Sunsei off of this building, and run him into the fucking armory just so I could score it. And coincidentally open some panoplies with whip 17. So I did win. Um, you get a lot of points in the armory for controlling it on the last turn. Um, and I had done more, <laughs> had done more, I'd done my classified and I'd opened more panoplies. My opponent was in retreat with three models by the end of the game. But that's something I will have to consider. If I play Yu Ching at this upcoming event, I'm running it. So I might just be the buy. We'll see how many players we have. Um, I'm going to need a list with some silhouette two models. Uh, and to that effect, a change that I am considering making in this list is actually removing the Lu Sheng because it's one for three for drops now. And yes, I know that statistically speaking, it actually makes quite a large percentage of its drops, but I just fucking hate that it does that. I also kind of dislike that it is vulnerable to all of the same things that a Battle Cat is vulnerable to. I'm considering replacing it with Jin Kuo, um, Shadow of Huangdi. So she's 36 points, so she's one point more expensive, but you can find that in this list if you need to. And she's she's kind of a good do everything model. So she's got stealth, she's got a multi rifle, she's got BS thirteen, she's got mimetism, she's a specialist, she's good at CC. She has climbing plus rather than super jump, which is a very relevant mobility skill. Um, she, for example, could have killed that um, that Kahu that was causing me such grief in that very first game. Um, I might give her a shot. Now, I am still thinking about going back to a version of the list with a doctor in it, um, but I'm not particularly keen to cut any of the really expensive pieces. I don't want to cut a Yan, the Yanho or Sunsei um, or the the Sujan, because the Sujan is amazing. So there's a pretty limited amount of, of chuffed left, basically, to put um, both Yan, uh, both Jin Kuo and a doctor and or Lang Kai back in. But yeah, in short, maybe the Beast Hunter goes. He's been, he's honestly been okay for his 16 points, to be perfectly frank. Can't really complain. The Beast Hunter has definitely been a kind of like serviceable and balanced piece. If it was cheaper, it would be a little OP. Um, if it was more expensive, it would be bad, basically. So kind of liking the Beast Hunter, but it is a piece that could be cut. Uh, for example, it, it ran across the table into CC with my opponent's Bolt Link in the, the second game that I played. That was back when Sun Si was killing Swiss Guard. And I just got crit in CC. Now, like that would have happened to anything, but you could tell like lack of significant negative mods, lack of positive mods. It's not actually a great CC piece. So we'll see. Anyway,
that kind of like wraps up. We're at uh, about 50 minutes now. That's three games. Hope you've enjoyed them. And I've really liked this kind of rediscovery of Yu Ching. Um, Sun Tzu in particular has done a massive amount for letting me actually fit all of the things into a list that I want. The Yan Huo has filled the role of fire support that I would usually use a tag to fill, but a Guizhou is kind of like a multi-role tag and it's expensive for that reason and a blue wolf doesn't have long range. Um, so like broadly, it, this also has been a really refreshing palette cleanser because I crutch on hacking a lot, like a lot. If I'm not playing Ariadna, I am crutching on hacking. And this is a list that is a modern military force that uses technology and is vulnerable to hacking, etc. Doesn't just sidestep the hacking game, but it uses long yards and camouflage markers and ablative defense, kind of in the way that was you, you did in N3, where you just had things that died or took time to kill in order to buy yourself time for the win. Um, and so, yeah, we had all three games um, here. Uh, no, two or three games, me going second. And I've been about 50-50 on that. I like going second um, and deploying second most of the time, even though Yu Ching is a very aggressive faction. Um, one of the games not featured was a game against Nomads, where I did go first. And um, it was another one of those, like, kind of everything failed, but I had enough orders left on the first turn to be like, all right, all of the attempts to, like, tease out my opponent's defenses and, and accomplish, like, small incremental advantage have failed. I now feel like I must win. I must win with the Sujan, and I have enough orders left to pull the trigger. So I did, and it did. But I'm trying to avoid that kind of like 60% play, basically. Anyway, Yu Ching is something that I've played for a bit now, and I feel like I could talk more about almost as kind of like a tactical or at length, um, but that would not be this video. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. I'm not sure what's coming up next. We will see what the Lost Lieutenant March challenge is. Maybe that will provide some inspiration. Otherwise, this has been a really interesting discovery um, of Yu Ching, kind of a rediscovery of the faction. And although the Sujan didn't spend loads and loads of time kicking my opponent's dick in their deployment zone, it also spent basically no time ending up hacked, <laughs> isolated, immobilized, and targeted on a rooftop in my opponent's DC. So I'm going to call that one a win. Overall, hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.